I'd like to make a few announcements before we start. One is that the two people who are coming here from Berlin and Hebron will be here tomorrow night at 145 Grinnell at 7 p.m. These are probably the best opportunity we'll have all semester to talk to people who are doing very active nonviolence in an extremely tense situation. Uh, but unfortunately, they won't be able to have that special meeting with us that we were planning. There might be something available at Bolt Hall at noon tomorrow. But I haven't gotten any details about it yet. If I do, I will just send out a course web announcement to everybody. Also, I want to say we got a very long, uh, very moving email this morning from someone in Somalia who's been watching the webcasts of this course. So, hi, C. I hope you're, you're watching this one. Uh, <laughs> it does give me a very good feeling that what we're doing here is going out, being used all over the world. And very violent situations. I think we should feel very good about that. Um, I found out yesterday, this is my fifth straight day of teaching nonviolence classes all over the state, uh, that there's an interesting project going on in Germany this summer. For those of you who are interested, speak a little German. <laughs> we see you, Amy. Uh, I'm going to leave these folders right here. So what I would like to try to do today is did I, uh, believe it or not, wrap up the discussion of Larzac, which has been going on for almost as long as the campaign did. Uh, there are a couple of uh, interesting issues that it uh, will flag for us and try to do all of that in a short order and move quickly to the question of uh, anti-militarist organizations. We've been talking about movements and uprisings and demonstrations and things of that kind. And we're going to talk today about institution building. This is sort of a new, a new mode for us. I mean, we've talked about the fact that there are institutions that do various kinds of helpful work. But we're going to get into a major institution which, in my humble opinion – and you know I am very humble and very opinionated uh, – in my humble opinion could, if done right in – course of time actually be that alternative that we're looking for to the war system. But let me postpone that and get back to Larzac. I left you in suspense. The conclusion – the uh, movement was coming to a climax. Uh, the farmers had handed over – this is in 1978 – handed in a thousand military papers refusing conscription. And they handed them into the UN, which was a major sort of escalation. And then in 1980, farmers met with people from Pogloff. And I'm sorry, I forgot to check where that is. I think it was a German city. I will, I'll double check that. Where people were resisting a nuclear plant. And 100,000 people assembled there. So. For those of you who took the first semester, your antennae are going up and saying, we may have a problem here. Imagine if the people who are sitting in the oak trees right here uh, on our campus were to win, get major concessions from the university, bring the administration to its knees. I don't think that's going to happen. But let's say they did that and at that moment they decided, okay, now that we've, we're on a roll, you know, we've got her in a position of advantage, we want to talk to you about uh, student fees. We want to see a 50 percent reduction in student fees across the board by next year or we go back to the trees. Okay, what would that be called and what would be the issues that are raised by this? Zoe. Yeah. Yeah, it's called no fresh issue and it's sort of a, a principle that it just applies in general to gentlemanly ways of adjusting diff differences and having conflicts. And that is when you're in a position of advantage, you are – you do not want to press to an issue that you haven't even been discussing. And why? Is this important? Why is this not just a polite strategic maneuver? What's at stake here? 
Né? Yeah, I mean, what, what you're saying is true, that if you keep on changing and adding, the you could lose focus on the original issue and it could fail. Um, but I would still consider that kind of strategic. I'm looking for a, like a theoretical reason why this is a bad thing to do. After all, your cause is just, their cause is unjust. Why shouldn't you ram home everything by means of winning? Shannon. Right. Right. It changes the model of the, the frame, I guess is the word we would use today. It reframes the whole interaction as a power struggle instead of as a discussion among equals. So it's like you're, you are escalating. You're moving from stage one to stage two. Okay, so that's the background now for our question. And the question is, when the farmers move – remember, the original issue was that land was going to be taken over by the military to expand, and expand a military base. Farmers are going to be run off. No more Roquefort cheese in Berkeley. Th that was the original issue. Now they're expressing solidarity with people at a f in another country who are working on another issue, namely anti-nuclearism. And there was incidentally a big deal. There were 100,000 people who gathered at that assembly. And to let you in on a little more that's going to happen, this is going to build out into an entire anti-globalist, anti-globalist uh, yeah, anti movement very soon. So. We know that there's such a thing as, quote, no fresh issue that you're, you want to observe or you change the dialogue. Here's my question. Do you think these guys were violating no fresh issue? Because you know there are there – are, it's a rather specific framework. And uh, it doesn't mean that once you've got an issue, you cling to that issue for the rest of time. Because that way, you know, we'd have people saving s whales over here and people being against nuclear plants over there. No connections would ever be built. So we have to develop a sense of whether this particular action and, and more generally when an action violates the no fresh issue uh, requirement and when it doesn't. So, Marcella, it looked like you didn't think it was a fresh issue. Why? Yeah. Well, I don't actually know whether it was a nuclear power plant or a nuclear missile installation. That would be an interesting thing to know, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I agree with you, as you probably suspected from the beginning. Uh, and what is happening here is not dredging up a fresh issue that wasn't on the table, but rather getting down to the underlying issue and realizing what connections it has. So I think if the students come down out of the oak trees and, let's say, just, just to completely fantasize here, let's say that the chancellor is forced to kneel in the mud outside the oak trees all night long and we get to talk to him in the morning. I'm not even in favor of this, much less am I predicting it. Uh, we then we talk to him in the morning and we, we start talking about student fees and stuff. That really would be a fresh issue because you've got a position of advantage, which was really not clearly the case yet with the farmers in Larzac. And it really is kind of unrelated unless you want to say that all evil is evil and all good is good. That's probably true in a sense, but uh, not in a useful sense. It would be blurring the distinction. So that, that's the two things, that the issue is unconnected and that you would be using the leverage of advantage to press home something you hadn't considered before. But in this case, neither of those applies. I think what's happening is this you push – you say, okay, we don't want this camp in our backyard. 
The next thing you discover is the whole French government was behind putting that camp in your backyard. And so you're really getting down to the bedrock of the issue. And that's going to take one step further now. Uh, very soon. Let me just wrap up quickly what actually happened. Uh, in July and September of that year, 1980, they concentrated on constructive program. That is, they went and did repairs and improvements on farms in Larzac, on the Larzac Plateau. And then some months later, on the 5th of June, 1981, President uh, François Mitterrand was elected. And as you know, he was a socialist. I don't know what a socialist is anymore in modern Europe, but he was a socialist, whatever that is. And he had made a campaign promise, which was, de l'instant, from the moment when I am president of this country, I'm going to withdraw the military base in Larzac. And Le Monde, which is sort of the New York Times of France, much better writing, less advertising, <laughs> but still somewhat the same problems. Um, they announced that uh, President Mitterrand would fulfill his campaign promise to revoke the expansion, and the campaign came to a successful conclusion. We're leading to the question of whether, in fact, the campaign helped to get Mitterrand elected, which I think it probably did, but it would be hard to know exactly to what extent. So that was the campaign. It was nine years. It, it worked, quote unquote, uh, beautifully. It followed the law of suffering. It followed the law of progression. I think we've just decided that it did not violate no fresh issue. And if we decided it, then it probably is the truth. And uh, it became really big by keeping the focus on a single issue which had deeper and deeper repercussions. So not only did it work, quote unquote, but it also worked in the sense that it did good work and are going on into the future. For one thing, I don't know how many of you know the name of José Bové. He's a uh, – does anybody know who this person is? Mm -hmm. He is a farmer and uh, he's a southern French sheep farmer. So he comes right from this community. And yeah, he is involved in labor unions, but he's famous for something else. Yes, Sashi. Mm -hmm. He's against uh, the GMOs, yeah, the genetically modified organisms. Well, he's not against the organisms. He's against the idea of genetically modifying them. And he's also famous for – yeah. He led some protests. Ashley is absolutely correct. And in one of those protests, he decided to torch uh, McDonald's that was being built in southern France. So this is now getting – now this is getting us into a gray area. Is property destruction part of nonviolence? We discussed it last semester. and came to the conclusion that it's not all that sweet because it's not very persuasive. It's coercive. You know, what you want to do is wait till whoever has the McDonald franchise sees the light and understands that they should turn it into a free clinic instead. But uh, you're taking away their option, the, their choice. If you burn down their establishment, you're only going to make them angrier and that's – that has – we've seen that happen right here on this campus in the case of destruction of laboratory equipment because by uh, PETA, animal groups like that. So whether Monsieur Beauvais is completely nonviolent or not uh, is – it's in the lap of the gods to discuss that one. But he's a very key player in anti-globalism as we know and love it today. And he got his start uh, in that movement and he got his encouragement from that movement. Another very important little item – if it's not – I mean the item is little, but the importance is great. The Larzac campaign introduced the word nonviolence into the French vocabulary. They had practically not discussed it before. I'm not saying that in every cafe on uh, Rue des Landres people say la nonviolence, eh, n'est-ce pas? But <laughs> at least it introduced the term into the discourse and think what an incredible – 
difference that could make. As uh, the philosopher Nietzsche said, die richtigen Originalen sind die Namengeber. The real original types are the ones who coin words for things, name givers, nomenclatures. That sometimes is not true, but sometimes it's true because you, how can you talk about something if you don't know what to call it? Or how can you talk about it sensibly if you're calling it by the wrong word, like free trade? You know. <laughs> so that's two very important things. And uh, then in August of 2003, there was a tremendous meeting, 8th, 9th, and 10th of August in Larzac. So it's now about 20 years since the Larzac peasants, 103 of them, stood forward and refused to accept the extension of the camp. They le led to more than 50,000 of them, permanent members and so forth. This rolled over uh, – I'm reading you an announcement about that meeting, that, that celebratory meeting. Not only to commemorate in nostalgia, in nostalgia this anniversary, but to carry out a vital struggle against the marchandisation, the uh, commercialization, mercantilization, turning every – what do we call it when we turn something into – commoditization. Isn't that commodi – commodification, thank you. Merci, Marcel. Uh, <laughs> but to carry forward this vital combat against the commodification of the planet. So, Amy? This was 2003, August. So this campaign had a very big uh, continuation into the future. So it worked, quote unquote, and it worked, no quotes. And it, it pretty much uh, went from start to finish without, as far as I know, a single act of even property destruction, unless you call eating some of the grass around the Mars, <laughs> the Eiffel Tower by sheep property destruction, but you know, that somehow that one doesn't bother me. So this was one of the uh, direct communications or transmissions of Gandhism into our modern world. Last semester we discussed how intense was the transmission from the freedom struggle in India to the civil rights movement. Here you see it going into areas where Gandhi did not explicitly uh, commit himself. He didn't say, I'm against globalism for a very simple reason. They had, didn't have the word yet. They didn't know that that was what was happening. Now, with your permission to – because David's going to be here any moment, I want to start talking about uh, the, an institution that's being built. And we've already discussed a general framework where we said that third party – Nonviolent intervention, David. Up. And civilian based defense are the two basic forms of using nonviolence against militarism today. Hi. Um, it's good to be up here on the platform. It's the first <laughs> time I'm taller than you. <laughs> Where's your car? Down below. Okay. Amy? Yeah. <laughs> Give me. You, you take your breath for a couple of minutes, David, and sure. give me a little introduction. And we'll go. Okay. So as I see it, this uh, uh, operation, third party nonviolent intervention, itself has two basic sources. One is in human rights work where human rights people have decided to uh, – that they can intervene in a country where human rights are being violated at, to a certain level. You know, we're not going to invade Canada because their the, they, their parking restrictions are too severe. But there comes a point where you feel that human dignity has been violated and all human beings are involved in this. And so you have what the French call a droit d'ingérence or a right or actual obligation to involve yourself, to intervene. So that's something that's come up slowly in human rights work. And you'll still see a lot of human rights rhetoric in the third party nonviolent intervention movement. And the other thing that uh, fed into the stream is Gandhi's invention of the Shanti Sena or the Army of Peace. Now his original conception was that you would have people living in a community, may or may not be from the district, 
and in times of peace they would furnish good offices to the community just to be there. You know, we discussed the way Hamas and Hezbollah and other groups that have an armed agenda, they do a lot of uh, alternative institution building and social service work that the regime isn't doing. So it's in their case, it's very much a mixture of good and bad. Our guys, Shanti Sinics, would be very much um, nonviolent. And so they would be there in the community. They'd get the trust of the community. And when ethnic tensions flared up, as unfortunately has been the story repeatedly in India since Gandhi's time, they would interpose themselves in various ways, including – well, I'll just kind of let David say exactly what what nonviolent interveners do today. But as fasting is to protest, interposition is to nonviolent intervention. In other words, as a last resort, if all else has failed and open conflict is happening, you will actually interpose yourself between the two parties. Now, that may seem like a very dangerous thing to do, and we're not saying it's not a dangerous thing to do. But uh, at the same time, you know, crossing the street <laughs> is a dangerous thing to do. Not doing anything about violence is an extremely dangerous thing to do. And the fact of the matter is that the track record of people doing this has actually been rather good. We've been, with the exception of uh, three people in the Middle East recently, and arguably they were doing something slightly different, uh, basically no one has been killed doing third-party nonviolent intervention. I was on this campus in the 1970s where there was a big protest against the ROTC. <sighs> Lord, <laughs> I get nostalgic sometimes thinking about the old days. And in those days, the ROTC was still called the ROTC. After years of work, we got them to change their name. It was tremendous progress, just like the School of the Americas watch. Anyway. They were in a little building called Callahan Hall, and one day a group of very angry students descended on Callahan Hall. They're picking up rocks. They were going to stone Callahan Hall. It was not a good idea because inside of Callahan Hall there were these racks of uh, rifles. I'd seen them when I went in to put up a poster about my nonviolence course. That was a lot of fun, but we'll talk about that some other time. They had racks and racks of rifles, and all of these you know, military affairs students have been trained how to use them. So you have all of this heavy equipment inside the building and all this stones and anger coming down. And suddenly a little group which existed for one month, I think, called Berkeley Students for Peace. They showed up. I don't know how – in those days they didn't have cell phones or anything. I don't know how they knew to be there. But they showed up and they just stood in between these two groups and said, if you throw stones, you'll hit us. So the people with the stones lost heart and they went back because they didn't want to hit their fellow students. They wanted to hit – ROTC people who were also their fellow students. That's the logic of violence. But uh, in this little miniature episode, you see what nonviolent intervention can do at this extreme verge of interposition. So in 1980, on Grindstone Island in Canada, a group formed itself called Peace Brigades International that decided to take volunteers, give them some training and do this kind of work wherever there are conflicts all over the world. They had some spectacular successes. It's unbelievable what a small group of people can do. They show up voluntarily risking their lives for the sake of peace, not for one party or against the other. That's, that's the magic formula here. Peace Brigades International, which is a very venerable, very honored institution, has more or less specialized in what they call protective accompaniment which puts them back in the human rights area. That means if a person is under a death threat, they can call PBI or their organization can call PBI, send people into the country, and they will accompany that person 24-7. Go to work with them, go home with them, and it can be spectacularly successful. In Guatemala in the early 80s when uh, the, human rights, the only human rights organization was being selectively assassinated, PBI went in and with like five or six people to accompany the leaders. And the minute they arrived on the scene, those assassinations stopped. That group was able to continue working and they – to use the one of their terms, 
PBI talks about creating a space for peace. They don't get involved. They don't get involved in policy. They just create the space so the people on the ground can have a discussion rather than a power struggle. But uh, in 1999, David, correct me if I'm wrong, you went to the Hague uh, Conference for Peace in, in the Hague. The <laughs> Sorry, Inca, that's a stupid joke. And uh, there you were heard giving a passionate, fiery speech, which I hope you're going to do here again today. This will be about the only kind you do. Uh, by a man named Mel Duncan who had had this notion independently of taking this concept and building it into a worldwide force. And between 1999 and the present, it's absolutely incredible what these guys and the number of others and about 90 global organizations who've joined them have been able to accomplish. So I would like uh, David to tell us about the group and to report on his recent trip to Sri Lanka, which was our pilot project. Our conflict is extremely intense as you know, and uh, where we've been for just about three years? Three just three and a half years now. Okay, good. So, David Hartzell. <laughs> well, uh, well, glad to be here, and uh, you're certainly pr you're lucky to be in a class on nonviolence with uh, Professor Nagler. I mean, I wish every, every young person in the world had a chance to uh, take a class on nonviolence. We might have a much uh, less warlike world. Well, I'd like to just uh, share with you um, a little bit about my own background and uh, what uh, what we're trying to do with the Nonviolent Peace Force, and then have time for your questions and discussion. My father had the uh, good sense to take my brother and me to Montgomery, Alabama, during the Montgomery bus boycott back in 1956. I was just 15 years old at the time. And uh, I'm sure you know from your reading, uh, the Montgomery boy bus boycott was uh, kind of the beginning of the reactivization of the uh, civil rights movement in this country. And when we went there, uh, tens of thousands of people were walking every day to work, you know, rather than ride the buses uh, uh, in, a, in an apartheid system. And several of the churches had been bombed. Martin Luther King's home had been, uh, had been shot at. Uh, I visited one cross where all that was left was uh, the, the pews were in splinters and there was a piece of the cross uh, up in the front. And uh, these people were saying, rather than hate these folks that are doing this to us, we're gonna try to love them. But we're not gonna compromise uh, with full human dignity. And so they kept walking to work rather than riding the segregated buses. And this is a 15-year-old uh, per young person had a great impact on me. She was, uh, <laughs> there is a different way to struggle than uh, you know, this age-old uh, method of war and violence. Well, partly uh, inspired by that experience in Montgomery, uh, I went to Howard University, which is a black university in Washington, D.C. And in 1960, when students in the South began uh, challenging segregation at the lunch counters, essentially everything was segregated at that time. Lunch counters, movie theaters, re uh, bathrooms, uh, drinking fountains, uh, motels, etc. Even UN, African UN diplomats driving from New York to Washington could not eat along the, the highway in Maryland. I could not sleep uh, in motels, etc. And so when the sit-ins began in the South, uh, some of us at Howard University uh, thought, gee whiz, <laughs> what's happening around here? And while things were integrated in Washington, D.C., in Maryland, Virginia, everything was segregated. So uh, we started going up to Maryland uh, every weekend, uh, my black friends and me, uh, going to a, a, a drugstore or a restaurant and they would close it down and arrest us and we would spend the weekend singing freedom songs uh, in prison. And on Monday morning they would release us and we'd go back to our classes until the next Saturday morning when we'd do the same. Well, the state of Virginia had passed a law saying anybody that sat in in Virginia would get a year in prison and a 
thousand dollar fine. Uh, and we thought we had better things to do with our lives than going to prison for a year and try to scrape together a thousand dollars, which is a lot, a lot of money in those days. So we kept going to Maryland, you know, rather than to challenge this. Well, the American Nazi Party was down in, in Virginia and uh, threatening to kill anybody that challenged the segregation laws. And in June, after our final examinations, we finally decided somebody's got to challenge this law. Uh, and 12 of us went through additional nonviolence training. How do you actually respond nonviolently in the face of uh, you know, horrendous violence? And we went to a people's drugstore uh, which, uh, in Arlington, which was essentially just across the river from Washington, D.C., but it was as if it was in Mississippi in terms of the mindset. And uh, within a couple minutes, the, the lunch counter had been closed, and we could hear sirens coming from every direction. And we thought, <laughs> here goes our year in prison. Uh, but the, the, lunch the lunch counter owner uh, did not want to arrest us because of bad publicity. But he also wasn't going to serve us any food. So we, we stayed there at the lunch counter on the stools for two days waiting for something to eat. And obviously, we got increasingly hungry. Um, but it was the most difficult two days of my life, not because of the hunger, but because of uh, what we had to face. Uh, American Nazi Party did come in with their swastikas uh, saying, uh, is we or is we ain't equals, you know, with pictures of apes. Uh, people uh, put lit cigarettes down our shirts. People spat at us. People punched us in the stomach so hard that uh, we would fall on the floor, and then they, you know, proceed to kick us. And finally, toward the uh, end of the second day, I was meditating on the Sermon on the Mount on loving your enemies. And a guy came up from behind me and he said, uh, "You nigger lover." And I turned around and looked at him, and I had the most terrible look of hatred in his eyes, and. In his hand was a switchblade. He says, if you don't get out of this store in two seconds, I'm going to stab this through your heart. And then I had two seconds to decide, do I really believe in nonviolence? Uh, or is that a nice thing to talk about in Sunday school and you know, in a nonviolence class? And I'd, well, we'd had a lot of practice. And I just looked him in the eyes. And I said, well, friend, do what you believe is right. But I'll still try to love you. And his jaw began to drop, and his hand that was like this began to fall, and he left the store. And that was kind of a powerful experience in terms of the power of nonviolence. But then we did something even more difficult. Uh, this had been on the front page of the Northern Virginia paper, and 500 people were gathered outside with rocks and stones and said, let's kill these folks, these troublemakers. Because we were disturbing the peace. I mean, there had been peace there before you know, anybody challenging segregation. Peace. Uh, you know, everybody stayed in their place. And we wrote a statement in which we appealed to the religious and community and political leaders of Arlington, Virginia, to use their influence to get the eating facilities open to everybody. But we said, if nothing changes in a week, we're going to be back. And that's what was very, very difficult. <laughs> in one week, we'll be back. And some friendly media people got us out alive, I'm happy to say. And we, when we crossed the bridge into Washington, D.C., it was like, you know, we're entering freedom land. <laughs> and literally, we shook in our shoes for six days. Do we have the courage to go back and do this again? And on the sixth day, we got a phone call, and the eating facilities had been opened in Arlington. And what that what I learned was 12 students with some courage had been able to make some change that could have happened 100, 200 years earlier. Uh, and somehow we had touched the hearts and consciences of the political, religious, community leaders, business leaders of that city to do what they could have done you know, 100 years earlier. So anyway, that was kind of the lifelong, the beginning of my lifelong uh, career in trying to uh, experiment with the power of nonviolence. 
or as our government would say, be a, a troublemaker, you know, a disturber of the peace, or a disturber of the war, as I you know, prefer to say. Uh, well, I've been involved in helping build nonviolent movements uh, ever since. Uh, during the Vietnam War, we were um, actually putting our bodies in, the, in front of ships that were carrying bombs to, uh, to Vietnam. We called it the People's Blockade. Uh, we were in small canoes and small sailboats. Uh, so we were threatened with 20 years in prison. Uh, but we said, you know, if this ship with all its bombs and munitions reaches its destination, that's going to be much worse than us getting 20 years in prison in terms of what. These are our brothers and sisters that are going to die. <coughs> and. Uh, on the, the day that the first ship that we blocked uh, was uh, lifting up anchor and heading out to sea, and we were paddling madly to try to stay right in front of that ship, uh, seven of the sailors way up high on the ship jumped into the ocean and began swimming toward our little peace flotilla, and which was on nationwide television in the New York Times. And <coughs> their, our courage had given them some courage. Their courage helped encourage others in the military to begin doing what they really believed deep down, that this was an immoral, illegal, stupid war, and to begin to resist that war. And if you've seen Sir, no, sir, <laughs> yeah, the United States couldn't fight anymore because the soldiers wouldn't fight. They wouldn't shoot. Um, work on the nonviolent campaign against nuclear power. Uh, here in California against Livermore Nuclear Weapons Labs, which is developing you know, a whole new generation of nuclear weapons. Um, Nuremberg Actions, where we did a campaign right here at Concord Naval Weapons Station, which where the United States has been shipping bombs and munitions all over the world ever since the Second World War. Uh, in the 80s, when we discovered that they were sending bombs and munitions to to kill our brothers and sisters in Nicaragua and Guatemala, El Salvador, we be began blocking those trains which were carrying those bombs. And we called them Nuremberg Actions. Because we weren't breaking any law from our point of view. We were upholding international law, which says individuals have a responsibility to disobey orders. To which are going to which are crimes against humanity and crimes against war, and to be silent is to be complicit in those crimes. So we couldn't remain silent when right here in our backyard, you know, we were shipping bombs that were going to kill children, women, old people. So that campaign continued, continued for years. I, I got my arm broken. Uh, my friend Brian Wilson was run over and had a head, big hole in his head and cut his leg cut off. But we, we were really saying, this is a world in which we're all brothers and sisters. And as Brian said to the commander in the base, our lives are not worth more than the people of Central America, and their lives are not worth less. That's a very radical idea. Because <laughs> in America, we like to think we're more important than anybody else. They give us their oil, and they give us their fruit, and all our manufactured goods, and you know, they have the privilege of serving us as Americans, because we're more important. And we're not the only nation like that. But um, so to really say we're all brothers and sisters and have a responsibility for one another is pretty radical. Well, uh, as Michael said, in, in 1999, uh, a gathering of 9,000 peace activists came together in The Hague. Uh, in uh, the Netherlands to look at how can we put an end to war, which is even a bigger challenge than how to <laughs> stop segregation uh, at, at lunch counters. And uh, as you know, at the beginning of the last century, about 10 or 15 percent of the people uh, who were killed in wars were, were civilians. By the end of the last century, it was more like 90 to 95 percent. This is UN figures. Our civilians, our people that don't have guns, that have nothing to do with, do I hate those people or are those my enemies? You know, they're just common human beings 
who have gotten caught up and they get killed. And that's the way, that's the normal way that we're using to try to resolve conflict in this world. It's wars where 90% of the people that die are going to be innocent civilians. And uh, our governments, as you know, keep saying, well, wars are the only way to really secure our country. And we're going to be men. You know, we're not going to put up with, you know, uh, second class, uh, you know, military stuff. So here we were, 9,000 people looking at how do we put an end to war. And unfortunately, at that, at that very moment in Kosovo, where there was ethnic cleansing going on against the ethnic Albanians, uh, President Clinton went on worldwide television and radio and said, in the face of this ethnic cleansing, we have two choices. We can look the other way and pretend it's not happening, or we can go in and start bombing. And I had been in Kosovo for three years, you know, before that, and I had witnessed <laughs> and worked with people that were trying to build a nonviolent movement and said, we need to use much more active nonviolent resistance to change this Milosevic dictatorship. Uh, but we need international people to be here present. David, can you find the people that come and be present with us? And I spoke and I talked and I went on radio and television saying, Kosovo is an explosion waiting to happen. They want to build a nonviolent movement but need international presence. Can you come? And everybody said, where's Kosovo? Because there had not been a war and nobody even had heard of it. And others said, oh, it sounds very important but, you know, I'm very busy. You know, I'm going to school, I have a job, family, you know, et cetera. And so we didn't go. And it exploded and uh, lots of violence. And then the, the, our president said, there's two choices. You can do nothing or you go in and start bombing. And many of us that were at The Hague realized, or we felt there was that, neither of those alternatives were, were acceptable. It's not acceptable to just look the other way and do nothing, and it's not acceptable to go in and start bombing people to, to show them that killing is wrong. And so, and we knew there was a third alternative, and we'd seen it working with Peace Brigades International and Witness of Peace and these kind of, of groups. But the world didn't know that there was a third alternative. So we committed ourselves to building a global nonviolent peace force of hundreds and eventually, we hope, thousands of trained nonviolent peacemakers that could go into conflict areas and be that third alternative. Uh, and that third alternative is helping provide, provide the political space where local peacemakers and human rights workers can do their work without <coughs> so much threat of being killed or disappeared. And so starting 90, 1999, we have been uh, meeting with and working with people all over the world that uh, are doing peacemaking in their own communities and countries and are working together to try to help build this third alternative. A, a way to really uh, both give moral support to local peacemakers who often feel very isolated and alone uh, in a very repressive and dangerous situation, but also to make it politically safer for them to continue their work. Uh, by just being eyes and conscience of the world. It's not we need to go in and we will create peace for these poor people that you know, are fighting each other. It's we will help make the, the political space the safety where they can you know, create that peace. So uh, we now have 94 organizations, peacemaking organizations from all over the world that are working together to create the Nonviolent Peace Force. In 2002, we had our founding conference in India we uh, have uh, eight Nobel Peace Laureates who've endorsed this, over 300 key religious political leaders from around the world. Um, check out our website, which is just www.nonviolentpeaceforce. Uh, and here are some flyers, which you might want to pass around. And if anyone would like to, If anyone would like to uh, be on our mailing list, uh, just sign your name and at least an email, and we will uh, get you updates about what no the Nonviolent Peace Force is doing. 
Uh, I spent two years traveling all around the world talking with these you know, peacemaking groups, human rights organizations, to see, to ask several questions. One is, do you think that a nonviolent peace force could help make a contribution to, to, to creating the peace and justice in your country? And almost everybody said yes. This could be very helpful. And then the second question I asked is, would you, be, would you like to help work to help make this possible? And you know, many, many of these people said yes. And as I say, we have 94 organizations. Well, some of the things that we heard from people around the world that, that should be qualities of this nonviolent peace force, one was the importance of early intervention. Don't wait until after it explodes into, into, into violent conflict. The other is the importance of uh, supporting nonviolent movements before they uh, explode into violence. Um, as we should have done in Kosovo, and we passed up that opportunity. The importance of being truly international and representing nobody's national interests. Uh, and so we have, in the Nonviolent Peace Force, about half of those 94 organizations are from the Global South, from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and half are from the Global no North. So we're not kind of northern do-gooders <laughs> trying to do something for our southern brothers and sisters, or vice versa. We're really representing the people of the world. Uh, and these are a little bit uh, outdated now, but these are some photographs of our uh, first uh, teams in uh, Sri Lanka, which you can see just by looking at this, there are uh, the faces are people from all over the world. We want to be mainstream. Uh, we want to go far beyond the traditional peace movement. And my own belief is that there are n at least 95% of the people in the world believe in nonviolent resolution of conflict over violence and war. And we need to recruit many of those people into this movement, both as, as nonviolent peacekeepers, peacemakers themselves, but in supporting this financially, et cetera. We go only at the invitation of local groups or primarily at the invitation of local groups. We don't say, oh, there's a conflict. I think we should go and cr help create the peace. There are, we go when a, a local group says, we are working to try to create peace in this area. We need your support, which is a, a little less imperialistic. Uh, we want to uh, recruit uh, skilled uh, people and make this professional. You know, we're not just kind of do-gooders wanting to go and put our finger in a dike somewhere <laughs> to, to try to create the peace. We want people who've been trained and have had some experience doing peacemaking in their own communities, in their own countries, um, that can um, be a part of the nonviolent peace force. We are, we are paying people who volunteer, volunteer to be a part of the nonviolent peace force. Nobody's going to get rich. But the world pays soldiers to be willing to kill and die. And we think that morally, we have a responsibility to help financially support people that are willing to risk their lives to help make nonviolent and peaceful solution of conflict real. But there's also the point that people from the global south wouldn't really be able to volunteer if they didn't right. have that kind of And we want to get people from all classes and all parts of the world. And many parts of the world, you know, I, 25-year-old person helps support the whole family. So this is a way of doing that, or pay, paying college loans and you know, that kind of stuff. We want to be nonpartisan, but with a commitment to justice. We're not coming in to say, this side is good and the, that side is bad. But, um, but we are committed to justice. You know, Long-term peace cannot happen you know, when there's a terribly unjust situation. Well. Uh, and this, I'll pass this around also. I, some of you may have seen this, but it's called What the World Wants. And this is actually a couple years old, so it's a bit out of date. But each of these squares reach, uh, represents $1 billion. And if you look at this, this whole page, this is, this is what the world spends on the military every year. It's now even much more than this. But way down here at the bottom is how much this amount of money would stop uh, deforestation all over the world. This amount of money would eliminate nuclear weapons from everywhere in the world. This would increase energy efficiency, 
rid the world of uh, homelessness, of poverty, of you know, hunger and all the diseases for a very small amount, percentage of what we're spending on the military, we could rid the world of all these problems. And wouldn't be, we'd be a whole lot safer <laughs> and more secure if that's what we're doing with our money. Well, we, often we don't even think about that stuff. Well, our government says pay your taxes and 50% of them go to, you know, in missiles and bombs and are fighting the war in Iraq, etc. Well, um, now I just last Thursday night I came back from Sri Lanka, uh, and the Nonviolent Peace Force has been asked to come all many places around the world, but we have limited amount of money so far. Our budget is probably less than uh, a couple toilets uh, in the Pentagon, um, but you know what the Pentagon is doing is much more important than what we're doing according to our government and and many other governments. So. Uh, at our founding co conference, we had to decide among the various choices, where can we, where should we do our first pilot project? And we decided on Sri Lanka. Um, partly at that time, uh, there had been a 18-year uh, civil war, and the two sides had said, we're willing to have a ceasefire. So the major contenders had said, war is not working. Let's try something else. And we had people that invited us to say, can you come and help really uh, move our country toward peace? Well, unfortunately, in the meantime, a new government has been elected that is essentially saying, we're going to win this war militarily. And the Tamil Tigers uh, ha have uh, said, you know, we're going to win this thing militarily. And uh, the people are getting caught in the middle just like other places in the world, that 85, 90% of the people uh, that are civilians are, are paying the brunt of this. Well, what the Nonviolent Peace Force is doing, uh, are you from Sri Lanka? OK. <laughs> well, you're an expert on this. But this is a little picture of uh, Sri Lanka. And this is at the southern tip of India. And this is a, uh, a primarily Buddhist country. 80% uh, or so are, are Buddhist, I think. And uh, the Tamil population, I think, is in the range of 10, 12%. And they are primarily up in the north and in the eastern part of the country. And then there's a, a smaller Muslim population. And part of the problem there, just like what was happening in Virginia and Alabama, is that 80% is saying, you know, uh, we're the most important people. And the Tamil-speaking people are second-class citizens. You know, they can't learn in school in their language, and you know, a lot of them are fired from their jobs and all this kind of stuff. That's, that's the source of conflict in so many parts of the world, is the majority says, you know, you guys aren't important. <laughs> uh, we're the first-class citizens. I mean, that's it's a little more complicated than that. But anyway, so the Nonviolent Peace Force has teams up in Jaffna. Uh, which is uh, totally military-occupied uh, uh, military country right now. Uh, the almost 95, 99% of the population is Tamil or, and Hindu. But all the military and the police are Sinhalese, Buddhist. And, all, so, and there's soldiers everywhere. I mean, at every street corner and in, in between. And with tanks, and the, the, the road to Chaffna isn't even open right now. So people can't get food and supplies and all this. And we're also over here uh, where there's also uh, primarily a Tamil population, but the military and police are Sinhalese. So these are very, very hot spots. And I think over 6,000 people were killed in this last year. And so that's where we are, right in the middle of these, these areas of conflict. And what we're doing, um, one is uh, there's been recruitment of child soldiers. I'm there, the re recruitment of children <laughs> to become child soldiers. And, and it's happening on a very broad basis and by both sides, both by the Tamil Tigers. And there was a, a, a group called the Karuna faction 
which uh, the, the political leader from the east of the Tamil Tigers, his name was Colonel Karuna, he broke away from the Tamil Tigers. Uh, but he's now allied with the government, fighting the Tamil Tigers. And um, so they are, both sides are recruiting children down to the age of 12 or 13 to, to start using guns and shooting each other. And there are many, many families who've had one child taken by one side and one child by the other. And the father has already been killed in the war. And uh, so these families have come to the Nonviolent Peace Force and said, can you help us? <laughs> and they are courageously trying to get their children back. And so we're accompanying them and helping train people that are accompanying them. Uh, there are peace committees made up of, uh, of Sinhalese, Buddhists, of Tamil uh, Tamils, and of Muslim populations to be people in the local communities that are saying, we've had it with this war. We want to <laughs> have peace for our children. And so are laying the basis for that kind of peace. There are just in the east, there are 70,000 uh, internally displaced people who've had to flee their homes in the last three months uh, from the bombing and the killing and are in refugee camps, which I visited. And uh, often these armed groups are coming into their, these refugee camps and forcibly taking out the kids. So what we're doing is providing a presence in these refugee camps to try to make it safer. And what we've been told is it's much safer when uh, we're present, or even if we're coming and visit um, you know, as often as we can. I met a very, very courageous Muslim leader in Batikalo uh, who uh, has faced death threats you know, for the last 20 years and is one of the most courageous guys I've ever met. And he is committed to trying to, to build a demilitarized zone within Sri Lanka and is personally going to go, he knows the top leadership of all the different sides. He's going to go to them and say, we want to create this demilitarized zone, peace zone, and we are asking you to guarantee the safety of the population and to not and respect that. And he's asking nonviolent peace force and anybody else we can recruit, including UN agencies, uh, the Anglican bishop is very interested in this in Sri Lanka, et cetera, to be an ongoing nonviolent presence uh, in this demilitarized zone. So that's something that's uh, right in the in, pro in process. Uh, there are specific individuals, including uh, human rights defenders and uh, priests and others working for peace that have active death threats against them. And when that's happening, and sometimes whole communities. And so we accompany those people, uh, similar to what uh, Professor Negler was saying happened in Guatemala uh, to make it safer for them. Sarvodia, you may have heard of, is probably the largest Gandhi-inspired movement in the world. It's active in 12 or 15,000 com communities in Sri Lanka. Uh, we're working with Sarvodia to develop a rapid response uh, peace, peace uh, brigade. So these are people trained in active nonviolent peacemaking. They can go into conflict areas when, when tensions are beginning to, to boil to try to help create some peace and uh, divert that uh, energy from war making into uh, peacemaking. Uh, we met with a number of the United, United Nations personnel while we were there and they are just extremely impressed with what the Nonviolent Peace Force is doing. And partly I think, and we met embassy people also from foreign embassies, I think they're feeling totally ashamed of how little they're able to do. And partly, you know, they represent governments and you know, all this stuff. Uh, and uh, when there's any kind of danger, they tell their, their staff, stay in, stay in the embassy. <laughs> stay in your office. Don't go out there. And here we're out in the communities and on the front lines. And partly, we've been able to do the, the homework <laughs> of finding out what's happening out there and then saying to the UN, et cetera, these folks you know, need your help. And they can rely on us and have come to trust us as people that are really in, t in, in t touch with the people. So uh, 
our role is to be on the ground in the areas where there's most conflict and where civilians are most endangered. As I said, we give moral protection. Uh, moral support, we're giving protection as an international presence so the world is watching. To be a monitoring presence so that uh, United Nations and others know what we're doing. And I won't tell the specifics, but uh, through our homework, we were able to document this child soldier stuff that then UN agencies were able to, to really go international and challenge that on our behalf. Uh, we're able to, to actually tell the truth about what's going on in the ground and to, and to provide the political space for local peacemakers to do their work. We also have active invitations from other parts of the world. Uh, in Colombia, uh, Peace Brigades International and the Fellowship of Reconciliation are accompanying one community, a peace community, that is saying no to all the warring sides. Well, there are 16 or 17 other peace communities throughout Colombia that are saying no to the government military, to the paramilitaries, and to the guerrillas. And their leaders are getting assassinated and disappeared. And they're asking the nonviolent peace force you know, to come. So uh, we've decided as soon as we can uh, develop the financial resources, we're going to go. And we're doing our first training uh, in, uh, in Spanish uh, in Ecuador in May of this year. In Mindanao, in the southern Philippines, where there's also been a, uh, a civil war for many years, uh, there are local very courageous local peacemakers that are, and human rights defenders that are trying to protect civilian populations who time and again get targeted in this stuff. And they have asked us to come and accompany them. And just last week, we found the money uh, from uh, several major uh, donors, contributors, to uh, we're going to be sending our first team of six people there a month after next to begin working with the local peacemakers. And in northern Uganda, uh, we are going to be uh, sending a team of people to work again uh, with local peacemakers uh, who are asking us to come. A guy named Rolf Carrier, uh, who is a Dutch man from uh, the Netherlands, has been the head of UNICEF for many years. And he's now retired, but is very excited about the power of nonviolent peacekeeping. And that as an alternative to armed peacekeeping or armed intervention. And so he's spending his time on his own money uh, going talking with his former colleagues in the United Nations about what we're doing. And he's found many of them that said, if, our, if the local UNICEF, UN High Commission for Refugees, et cetera, say nonviolent peacekeeper will, will really make the difference, we will support that morally and financially for the actual deployment cost, which is the major part of it. But what we need to do is to recruit and train 500 people uh, to be able to be ready to respond to those kind of requests. So our goal is to recruit and train uh, 500 uh, people from all parts of the world to be a part of uh, a nonviolent reserves, ready to go into any of these conflict areas at the invitation of the UN or other groups. Um, we're about to also start a short-term deployment in Guatemala. Uh, you probably don't even know about this, but our, our co-chair, uh, Claudia Samayoa, who's been doing very courageous work in Guatemala, is facing death threats again. So we're recruiting fluent-speaking, uh, Spanish-speaking people that would like to go to Guatemala and essentially be her nonviolent bodyguard. And I spent a couple days doing this uh, a year ago. And I couldn't, nothing would be more exciting. <laughs> I don't mean exciting because somebody's there with a gun. But exciting because of the kind of people that you meet and the kind of what, what she and others are doing every day in trying to, uh, um, uh, among other things, they're trying to get to the bottom of who did this massive genocidal violence in the 80s. And that's, that's very dangerous. Because a lot of people don't want anybody to know <laughs> who did that. Uh, but that's what they're doing. Uh, Oaxaca, uh, where, as you know, there's been a massive nonviolent struggle. People are asking us to come in and do nonviolence training. So we hope uh, 
later this spring to be responding to that. And in Lebanon, there's interest on the Israeli-Lebanon border uh, to have a nonviolent presence. John Paul Lederach, uh, who's uh, a colleague of ours, has, has written a paper in which he's proposing 250,000 nonviolent peacekeepers. And he suggests ways to finance that, including a, uh, a peace tax on any war industry that's going to make money off of bombs and, and bullets needs to give just 2% you know, toward you know, a, a nonviolent peace force. You know, there's businesses that are you know, making profits off of you know, stuff. They can give 2% uh, of their. So anyway, we could do this if the world decides that this is politically important. So things that you can do, uh, you could consider uh, giving one or two years of your life to being a part of uh, the Nonviolent Peace Force. And if you're interested in doing that, it's not just courses in nonviolence, which are very important, but beginning to try to get some experience in doing this kind of work in your own community. Hmm? After. <laughs> well, I mean, you probably heard there was a tent, tent uh, city in Richmond, you know, in the areas where most people were getting killed. And local community people set up a, a tent city, same idea as what we're doing in Sri Lanka, and said, this is a peace zone. <laughs> and they, uh, you know, invited other people to come and be present there. Well, I think very few of us did, but that would be an example of the kind of thing that people could do. Uh, yeah. Uh, just finally to say that uh, one of the things that we're doing right now, if any of you are interested, on the first Thursday of every month uh, at the Federal Building in San Francisco, we're doing a die-in. Um, 560,000 Iraqi people have died in this war. 3,100 Americans have been killed in addition to you know, many, many thousand wounded for life, mentally as well as physically. And we're trying to remember that. And we're reading the names of the war dead. And uh, many of us have been arrested each, each Thursday, because that's not uh, the first Thursday of each month, because that's not appreciated. But at 1 o'clock this Thursday and the first Thursday of every month, that's what we're doing over in San Francisco. And any of you are welcome to look at nonviolence in action. So uh, that's a little bit about the Nonviolent Peace Force. And as I said, uh, the sign up list, if you would like to be informed, um, and uh, about new openings, we're going to be doing, uh, we hope if we can find the funds, at least four core trainings uh, this year of people that are really interested in uh, working actively in the Nonviolent Peace Force. And so now I, I took a little longer than I planned, but uh, I'd like to hear your questions or comments. Yes. Did we what? All the yes, all the expenses of of people on the ground are covered: food, and shelter, medical insurance, etc. And we we give eight hundred dollars a month, <coughs> either to your family or you get it when you leave. The idea is not to live high on the hog while you're in the country, but if you need it for college loans or you know supporting your family, whatever, that's what it's for. Or or it's a whatever you call it, it's a, when you're finished, a readjustment allowance, <laughs> like the Peace Corps has. Other questions, comments? I wowed them. <laughs> yeah. The question was, uh, what if we have more requests to come to conflict areas than, than we actually can do? Well, uh, that, that's the case. I mean, we've had uh, requests from at least 15 <laughs> conflict areas. And uh, if, you're, if you look at our website, you'll see, uh, among other things, uh, a, uh, a link to, uh, well, there's, there's several things. There's a link to Peace Workers UK website, which is where you can sign up on a register to say, I'm interested in being a member of the Nonviolent Peace Force. Uh, you can uh, look at our feasibility study in which we looked at what are the lessons to be learned from past peacemaking efforts. And among that is criteria for you know, where it's most important for us to go. 
Uh, and that when we have more requests than we can actually go to, that's you know it's looking at what are the criteria. So I mean I mentioned some of that, but it's it's where there are actual local peacemakers or groups on the ground that are inviting us. It is uh, where we think that nonviolent you know peacekeepers could actually make a difference. It's not just you know it'd be nice if we were there, but the people on the ground say this is going to save lives. This is going to help move us from war to peace, you know, et cetera, um, et cetera. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. But I think one of the criteria is is this going to be acknowledged by the rest of the world as we do something? Yeah. So it's visibility. Visibility. Yeah. But uh, and and we our international governing council, you know, makes those decisions. I mean, the staff does the re the research and the groundwork, but then that international body, you know, uh, makes the actual decision on a deployment. Yes. With the list in your conference, are you are you willing to make some really investment in the government? Or are we what? Where we're being invited to go? Yeah. Well, it, it's the whole range. Uh, it's often not the civilians that are fighting the government. You know, it, it's armed armed factions, and you know, it, you, you could often say there may be some justice on one or both sides, but it's the civilians that are getting caught in the middle. Um, I mean, and. Well, I mean, you know, Burma is another example. You know, it was just a very, very repressive government, and Aung San Suu Kyi is uh, leading a, a, a very courageous nonviolent movement. Uh, Tibet is another example. Uh, where, you know, the odds are very great <laughs> against the Tibetans. Uh, uh, Israel, Palestine, you know, where there are people on both sides that are nonviolently trying to transform that situation into a, into a more peaceful one. Uh, in Zimbabwe, where again there's a very repressive government, but very courageous uh, movement, and especially the women that are resisting that and are getting beaten up and arrested, and their children are getting arrested with them. You know, uh, it, it's it's similar to what Kosovo was. I think the place is going to explode. If somehow we can't get some support, you know, to you know those people that are struggling nonviolently uh, to challenge that, so, uh, but it's as I say, in my my feeling, the top priority is where there is a local nonviolent movement that is really trying to change that situation, and to have international presence can make that space for that to happen. Uh, civilians are actually getting caught in the middle of this stuff all over the world. And so our need is everywhere. <laughs> but And we've just developed a strategic plan. A woman who lives here in Berkeley, uh, Joan Bernstein, has, uh, with input from our whole constituency all around the world, developed a strategic plan for the next 10 years in terms of how do we grow from where, from where we are to where we want to be of thousands of peacemakers. And that's something that's, you know, it, before too long, we'll have that on our website as well. Say something about the training. Okay. <coughs> uh, that's another thing you can look at on our website. But we've developed a, a three-week training course called Opening Space for Democracy. Uh, and about half of that is also on uh, the Training for Change website. There's a link from our, our website, just trainingforchange.org. And it's really training in third-party nonviolent intervention. So it's looking at what's the history of doing this kind of nonviolent peacekeeping in areas of conflict, what worked and what didn't work, of looking at accompaniment and monitoring, interposition, and how do we do that, and doing role plays and whole simulation games where you actually get to practice this, this stuff. It's team building because uh, obviously just having a bunch of individuals trying to do their own thing in an area of conflict is 1% is, <laughs> is, uh, as effective as having people really working together well as a team. It's multicultural. It's uh, uh, learning to work multiculturally and uh, 
how the importance of really uh, being observant and respectful of local cultures. Um, I think having Americans, we often have this tendency to come in and say, we know how to do things, you know, and uh, as this is the right way. <laughs> well, that's not going to work in this kind of a situation. So, um, but a lot of role playing, um, really looking at what does nonviolence mean and how do we practice that, both, you know, on a personal level as well as um, in a war zone. But if you look at the, the website, you'll see a whole lot of that training manual. That's training for change. Yes. Well, our ideal is to have people that are uh, fluent in the language. And when we go to Colombia, for instance, we will uh, fluent Spanish will be a requirement. Sri Lanka is much more difficult because Sinhalese and Tamil, and it's and the Tamil they speak in Sri Lanka is different than the Tamil in India. Uh, it's it's much more difficult. <laughs> so what we've done there is to actually hire local people that after we get to know them that are not you know partisan one side or another who actually uh, work both as translators and as you know part of the teams. Um, but ideally, and language training is part of uh, the training. In addition to that three week intensive core training, we have in country training. Um, which will, uh, and, and language training is a major part of that. Yes? How do we decide when to leave a country? Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, in our, in our uh, feasibility study, we also have uh, criteria for, you know, when to leave. And, uh, that's one of the things that I think even in, in war making they need. I mean, in Iraq, you know, when is, when is the time to leave? When it seems like we're no longer appreciated. But uh, so in many of these areas, in most of these areas, uh, we have local partners, you know, who are, as I said, the heart and soul of this kind of, of, of the peacemaking. When they say, you know, you've been a, made a real helpful contribution here, but you know, I, I think we can do it on our own. That, that's, you know, we need to be listening to them. We need to look at our own experience. Are we really making a difference? Uh, both in terms of protecting people and helping moving from war to peace. Uh, and you know, if it gets, I mean, that, that's on the positive side, and if it gets so dangerous that we have to put most of our energy into how to protect our own people, as opposed to protecting the people there, and or if the two sides don't care what international people think, or you know whether they get killed or, or disappeared. Uh, that's a clear sign we're not really, that's not the best use of our resources. This is, a, this is a slight aside, but this is a good question for you is, uh, you know, learning about Satyagraha. In, we, th we often think of Buddhists as being very peaceful. Well, in Sri Lanka right now, there's very kind of uh, uh, right-wing na or nationalist Buddhist monks that are fasting to get the government to end the ceasefire and declare full-scale war against the Tamil Tigers. Well, some people called that satyagraha action. Uh, I'm afraid I don't. I, I, I think there has to be some element I mean, based on love <laughs> or uh, ju justice or compassion you know, for, the, for the other, <laughs> not just thinking about your own self for it to really be satyagraha, but you know, you'll have to develop your own answer to that question. <laughs> but that's happening right now. <laughs> Thank you.